For this last part of our lesson on the Constitution, we're going to take a look at the process of ratification. That is, how the Constitution actually became our government. And what you have to understand is there was a huge debate over it. There were the Federalists who argued that this was the right way to go, but then there were all of those founding fathers, men particularly like Samuel Adams and Patrick Henry, who argued that this was not the way to go. In fact, several of the presidents who had been presidents of the Continental Congress argued that such a constitution would create a far too powerful federal government that might tax its people as upwards as 4%, which of course is laughable compared to some of today's tax rates. But even so, what I love about the debate that occurred after the Constitution was that both the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists seem to have a respect for the common man's opinion. Let me read to you a couple quotes, uh, both by men who tend to lean on the Anti-Federalist side. Uh, there was a writer by the name of Cato. We think it might have been the founding father, George Clinton, but we're not entirely certain. Anyway, he wrote this. Ordinary people are the best judges where things go well or ill for the public. Every plowman, that's essentially the farmer, knows a good government from a bad one. Thomas Jefferson said this. He says, state a problem to a plowman and a professor. The former, the plowman that is, will decide it often better than the latter because he has not been led astray by artificial rules. In other words, there's an incredible respect that common men who have things they want to protect, like their livelihood, like their families, like their homes, will often make the best decisions because they're the most committed. They own something that they love dearly and they want to protect it in all justice. It's the whole idea of protecting life, liberty, and property. Even so, these men, these common men who would often decide these issues, often realized that one of the problems that existed under the Articles of Confederation was that it was often held together by very strong personalities, men like George Washington. So they recognized that there had to be some better form of government, something that had that checks and balances like we mentioned. And so many of the Anti-Federalists eventually agreed to the Constitution so long as it had a Bill of Rights. And in fact, the Bill of Rights, which is those first 10 amendments of the Constitution, is seen as pivotal to our liberty and freedom. It guarantees things such as the freedom of conscience, as things like freedom of speech or freedom of religion or freedom of press or freedom of assembly. It guarantees things like the rights for us to arm ourselves and to defend ourselves with weapons. It guarantees the rights of prisoners. So we have all kinds of rights when it comes to things like trials or things like witnesses being brought against us or whether or not we have access to justice, which of course it gives us. It also guarantees the rights of the states and the people. In fact, the Bill of Rights really shows that the federal government has very clearly set limits and the rest of the things the Constitution does not grant to the government are left up to the states and the people to solve. Of course, the problem with the Bill of Rights is what Alexander Hamilton pointed out. Hamilton said that the Bill of Rights was unnecessary because the entire Constitution was a Bill of Rights. His point was this. He said that if the federal government says what rights are actually in existence, then number one, it'll lead people to believe that the federal government has the ability to give rights. It doesn't. No government can give rights. They can only recognize the rights that God has already given us. The other issue with the Bill of Rights, he said, was that if the government lists what these rights are, then it might mean that rights you would already have, if they're not listed or not written down, then they might be taken away. For example, the right to life is under significant attack in our modern times through legalized abortion, which is allowed by the state. Even so, with all of the problems of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights were still brilliant, and because of that, the Constitution would be ratified by the necessary nine states in the year 1788. By two years later, all of the states had ratified it, and the following year, in 1791, Vermont had also joined the United States by ratifying the Constitution itself. With all of its flaws that eventually led to things like the war between the states and didn't deal with things like slavery or exactly how the president should be elected, 
because of that principle of federalism, because of the whole idea of covenant, of having a leader, or leaders in this case, who had very clear checks on their power and had very clear written laws they had to follow. Because of that, the Constitution has created a long-lasting government with a great tradition of freedom. That's the real lesson of the Constitution and why you should know it very well.